of our message today is God's way, not our way. What does it look like to God when we do things our way? Just picture God in heaven watching us faithfully. He is the word, but he's given us free will. So what does it look like to God as he watches us do our Christian walk with him our way? Amen. I have a catchphrase, Yahweh, not my way. Yeah. So Yahweh is the name of God, one of the names of God in the Old Testament. Yahweh, the name Yahweh speaks of God's provisions and his promises for each of us. Also in the Old Testament, we also have John the Baptist, who is telling us, repent, make straight the ways of the Lord, following those lines, those portions, the pathway of the shepherd. I want to talk to you about the effects of sin. One way that sin affects each believer, each of us, sin makes us stop thinking like God. One of sin's effects, it makes us stop thinking like God. Sin leads us to behave in ignorance, and ignorance moves us away from God's knowledge. We don't want to do that, do we? Sin's effect also leads us into a negative state of mind. We don't want to be there either. When we find ourselves in a negative state of mind, Pay attention because God in his infinite love is trying to lead you back closer with him. So sin's effect, for instance, if we ignore a policeman, and I know that we're all from different countries here, but if we ignore a policeman who is following us with his lights flashing, it does not excuse us from following the law. We have to follow the law. Now, if we think we're excused, it doesn't matter because the policeman is still going to follow us. And he may even call for backup. After an encounter with the police, you can be sure that we're going to be very careful that we keep our speed straight when we're driving, that we're not texting and driving. Why? Because that encounter with the policeman is going to rejuvenate our fear of the law of the land. We don't want to go to court. We don't want to get in trouble. We don't want to pay higher car insurance. We don't want to lose a day of work. And absolutely, we do not want to pay the fine. What does God see when we sin? Does he see our fear of him, a healthy fear of him? Is it greater, more important than our fear of the law of the land, the fear of our bill collectors, the things that we fear? Is God in first place? It's really important to our relationship, a healthy fear of God. Because even though we're saved, when we sin, It does not excuse us from the covenant that we've made with him. The Holy Spirit will convict us. There will be a a sense of a burden, hopefully, and we will repent because we know that Jesus paid the price for us. Amen. Repentance is a great gift. The unsaved do not have this gift. We do. The unsaved can repent and come to Jesus, but we have the Holy Spirit convicting us to stay right with God. So in the Bible, throughout the Bible, we hear a lot about sin. Sin, a three-letter word, very small, but it has eternal consequences. So here is what God has to say. Isaiah 1 and 3. The ox knows its owner, 
and the ass, the donkey, knows its master's crib where it goes to eat. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Think about that. Chew on this after this Bible study. My people do not consider. Do we really pay attention to the weight of sin, even as the redeemed of the Lord? The animals, compared to us, we see them as little smarts because we're created in God's image. We're the top of the food chain. We were given dominion of the earth, yet animals follow their natural instincts to their owner, to their master. Yet mankind fights against their instinct of eternity. Think about that. We fight against our natural instinct of eternity. Are we eternally driven to finish our race well? Many times we hear, get saved, you're done. That's not how it works. It's a race. The end of the race is as important as the beginning of the race. We know within that we are not made for this world, but we argue, we reason against our human instinct. We will even make excuses. We can pick out a scripture we like and ignore the rest of the book, but it does not excuse us from our covenant with God. It is only as we understand sin and see ourselves as sinners that we have any hope whatsoever of being delivered. I'm getting ready to travel to do some training and deliverance. First thing God said, most important thing to learn about deliverance is to know about sin because sin causes so much problems in our lives. The Bible puts repentance before faith. We are to repent and then believe the gospel. So Jesus preached, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus preached. This is what we all need to preach. Amen. Repentance and faith go together, but repentance in the Bible, I've looked it up, comes first. We have to see our need we have to be focused on our eternal race to repent and obey our master. How serious should we be about repenting? As serious as why people should come to Jesus. Think about that. These two go together. So why did each of you, me, all of us, come to Jesus? This is a very important question that we should spend time in prayer about with the Lord. Why did we come to Jesus? We knew that we were led by the Holy Spirit, that we had to get right with God. Yet the Bible teaches us we have to stay right with God. So we must consider this question in detail. Why? Because others want to know. What is our response going to be to others who ask us? Because our commission is to preach Jesus to others. This is what Jesus preached to us. Repent and believe in the gospel. So why is repentance so key in the life of a believer? Many people choose Jesus just for eternal life in heaven. They think I'll say the prayer, that's it, I'm going to heaven. But eternal life begins at the very moment of salvation. We have to come face to face with all the ills in our life, in our world, because there's truly only one answer. Everything we go through, it doesn't matter if you're saved or you're unsaved, there's only one answer. And we have to be able to tell people the remedy. We carry the remedy 
to every ill in this world. So the gospel is the way of salvation. It's the only way that our ills can be cured. I mean, every day here and now, every pain, every torment, everything that we see, we carry the answer. This is the good news. This is the good news that everybody is needing to hear. Now, in our verse, Isaiah was talking about the people that lived in Judah and Jerusalem, but he's talking to all the people of God because at various times, all throughout history, there's always been trouble. There's always gonna be trouble. And the root of all of our problems, every problem, comes from doing things our way and not God's way. So this is still a problem today. Back then, Israel didn't think it was a problem. Many today don't think we're doing much wrong, but that is the problem. Because Isaiah, in this verse, is teaching us to go deeper. We're being taught to look into the depths of sin. We know that faith is alive. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But sin is also alive. It has a nature. It has consequences. And we can see its effects in our families, all around us. And we can be saved, yet still rebel against God. This is what takes place in the millennium. You know, it's all about in the millennium realm, the enemy's in the pit. Jesus is living with us in the earth. Then the enemy gets out. People again turn and rebel again. How many of you believe that we're living in the end times? I know that I do. I believe that the rapture of the church is possibly the next great prophetic move. Now, some say that the church today is dead. It's wounded. It's powerless. But the church is alive and well and in great numbers. God is still the head of the church. The world does not change God. God is still in control in his time of the world. He is in control. But I do believe that the rapture of the church is eminent. Whether you believe in the rapture or not, it doesn't matter. You could say it's pre, post, mo whatever. It doesn't matter. We know that God said he is coming back. So the question is, are we ready? Are we ready? I see that the world also believes that the rapture of the church is imminent because they're already acting like we're almost out of here. I've never seen the world as crazy as it is now. We don't even know where to go with all this craziness around us except into the word. Now, the world prefers their own message of what's going on, but it's not the message of God. We go by God's word and God's way of doing things. So when it comes to believing, we used to be able to turn on the TV and get an accurate weather report, get accurate news. We can't even do that anymore. And this is a good thing because we're not supposed to believe man. We're always supposed to believe the word of God. And if man is speaking God's word and it lines up, then praise the Lord, amen? Are we ready? Are we taking the end of our race serious? Is our relationship with God important enough to make sure that we're right with God every day according to his word? When I was going through my affliction, the 30 years that I suffered, I had so many things wrong with me and the list was only getting longer. During those 30 years, I was believing God. I absolutely knew that God was gonna heal me because I had his word and I was only going by the book because only God 
deserves my loyalty. But I got to the point where I wanted to read the Bible from the beginning to the end with the Holy Spirit, focusing on sin and its consequences. I was going to repent for every sin because I wanted to be healed all at once. I was going to repent of sins that I did not even do because I was repenting for people in the body of Christ. I did not want to have any sin, any guilt by association. I was going to repent. Today, we see rebellion everywhere, socially, politically, in our economy, our news, our neighborhood, our families. Why do we see this mess? There's a reason. It's not so that we get depressed, that we believe everything negative, that negative state of mind. We see it because we are the church. We are to repent. We are to pray for the things that are going on around us. Because it's not that a governor, a senator, a politician, or whoever is in charge. We carry the authority of God. Our prayers change things. Yes? And we need to be reminded of this. So in Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2, John on the island of Patmos, in a vision, received instructions to rise, measure the temple, measure the temple of God and the altar, count the worshipers. But he was warned not to measure the outer court of the temple. So in the Bible, this is after the rapture, the second half of the tribulation, the outer court has already been turned over to unholy nations. But this scripture is prophetic for the church today. We are not to focus on the ungodliness around us. God wants us to focus, to concentrate on his presence in the temple, at the altar, with all of us together as we worship him, those who wholeheartedly love God. I don't want to be on the outside looking in. And I know neither do you. I take God seriously at his word. God said he will not be mocked and he does not lie. And I do not want to go through the tribulation. So the word says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars in their portion they will be in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, which is the second death. You know, I think about David. David murdered Uriah, but he repented. And we see the glorious relationship between him and God. Cain did not repent for killing Abel. And he said his punishment was way too great for him to bear. Now, I don't know the personal relationship between God and Cain, but I'm not going to chance my eternal life. I'm going to take all the sin in the Bible, everything that God says, seriously. And it says a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes lies will perish. Do you think in the Bible God is only talking to the unsaved? Because I think he's talking to all of us, and that scripture is Proverbs um, 19, 9. When we lie, and we all lie, we think that we get away with it. We, we even have the term a little white lie. We think that it's normal. Everybody does it, but it's not normal. It's not what God does. And we do not want to put our eternal life in jeopardy or our relationship with him. When we lie, we have to understand how God sees us. If I lie into a person's face, I have to understand that I'm lying into the face of God. God is everywhere. He is ever present. He knows everything about each of us. He sees all. 
You know, when people lie to us, it hurts us. We don't want to be lied to. So we repent for all the people that we've lied to, even though we don't know whether it hurt them or not. We repent for thinking that it was normal. We repent for thinking that, okay, as long as I don't get caught, there's nothing that God does not know. And I don't want to lie into God's face. I don't want to hurt his people, his creation. He is love. I'm just telling you this to explain that it is our natural instinct to rebel against our eternal destiny. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, John 1, 9. God always left a remnant. We see it with Lot, with Abraham. We can follow God's remnant throughout the Bible. Today, we are God's remnant. We truly love God. We want to obey his word. He means more than anything in this world to us. We see problems everywhere, even in the church. Where there are problems, we know there is going to be consequences. But in the body of Christ, we are his remnant. We are dedicated to God wholeheartedly. We are dedicated to abide with him each and every day. We are dedicated to reading the word, dedicated to a life in prayer. You know, John was told, don't measure the outer court. But we are told to pray without ceasing. Prayer is not a special gift only given to intercessors. Prayer for each of us is mandatory in the kingdom of heaven right here, right now. So how is your prayer life? When I was going through my 30 years, I learned to pray even into my future. Problems will always remain but what does history teach us? We see the answer so clearly in the Bible. Did Sodom learn? Did the people in Noah's day learn? Do we still see the problems today? Do we see them changing for the good? The greatest spiritual moves are found in times of hardness and not when things are easy and breezy. This is a very exciting time to be alive. Great movements of God happen in times of hardness. When people cry out to God, things change. God changes things when we cry out because we're repenting. And times of peace, prosperity, and blessings. This is when we take, this is when we make mistakes. When it's everything is peaceful. We kind of take God for granted because, you know, everything is so cool. We think God's happy. We're happy. But God told us trials and tribulations, they're going to remain. I learned this lesson, what I went through. When you are in times of peace, prosperity, and blessing, get on your knees and pray as if you have never prayed before. When my affliction came, it devastated my whole body to the point where I was unable to pray. And I was counting on the prayers of the saints, hoping they were praying for me. Amen. This is a very important lesson that I thank God not everybody has to go through, but I'm sharing it with you. So God is always listening to the prayers of the remnant. You know, Abraham said, God, if 50, will you not destroy 10, will you not destroy? Our prayers are very important to God. I'm going to show you why too. So what is the job of the remnant? What is our job? Exodus 26 and 12 says, in the remnant that remains, it's a curtain. God is speaking about a curtain on the inside of the holy of holies. Now, if you read Exodus 26, it may sound boring, but if you read it with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to enlighten you to know that this whole passage is about God's relationship with us. 
It's us and him, the remnant on the inside. It's in this temple, in the Holy of Holies, in this curtain that the remnant is represented. The beauty of these curtains were only seen on the inside. Only the priests could see these curtains as they entered into minister to the Lord and with the Lord. So prayer as the remnant is a habitation in the realm of God. The linen of these curtains represents holiness. The blue in the curtains represents heaven. The shamayim that we see over our heads every day, that blue represents holiness that's permeated with the love of God. The red and the blue that was interwoven into the curtains represents the manifested royal blood of Jesus that we carry into prayer with us when the remnant, when we pray before God, we can bring the sins of the world. The Father will look at us and see the blood sacrifice of Jesus on us and people are forgiven. Amen. This is our job to pray, to know how to enter, to know the manifested presence of God. So here we are, the remnant. Crazy is still all around us, but we can't be distracted. We have to be stealth. We have to be focused, knowing that every single distraction wants to take our mind off of where we should be right now. We are separated unto God in the kingdom for such a time as this. And to conclude this message, I want you to think that in one hour, life will change when the church is removed from the earth. I watch God. We watch for God. It means we are preparing ourselves for God every single day for his return. We don't know when, but we want to be ready because in one hour, one hour, we have to be ready before that hour. So are we ready? Are we clean? Are we living clean, holy lives? The secret sins have to go. They have to be repented of. God is not mocked. He knows what is with us. Ask the Holy Spirit to uncover all. Take repentance as seriously as you take your salvation. We want to be a spotless bride consecrated unto the Son. And as we're waiting, we obey God. We do what he told us to do. We serve him. We serve each other like we're doing today. And we serve the world around us. So in repentance and in faith, we have the answer. We have Jesus. We have the answer to every question that this world has. Are we prepared to preach him to those who ask us? We pray for souls. You know, the Lord taught me while I was going through all the trials and tribulations to pray so deep into my future, into the future of our families, into the future of our neighbors, into the future of the souls that do not know him. This is our prayer life. We do this from our heart. We just want God to be delighted as we obey him because we carry the good news. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So Father, we give you all the glory. We thank you, Father, for all that you have brought here today. We thank you, Father, that you know every desire of their heart. We thank you, Father, that we have prayed for all who have come here today. And we thank you, Father, for your manifested presence in all that you are about to do. So we give God all the glory. Amen. Amen. JesusTodayMinistries.org. We are here to minister 
and to pray with you right in the comfort of your own home or your office. If you are seeking counseling, healing, deliverance, financial breakthrough, if you feel that there is a block or you're experiencing hindrance in your blessings, please know that God cares about you and all that concerns you. Hi, my name is Peggy Golden. I am a pastor and I have a master's in Christian counseling. God has made a way for people all over the world to receive counsel, healing, and deliverance through the use of technology right in your own homes. God heals, saves, and delivers his people every hour of the day. There is no distance for God. If you do not know God, if you are seeking him, or if you have found yourself in a situation that you need help getting out of, please know nothing is too hard for God. Please visit my website at jesustodayministries.org. You can get to know more about me there. And please remember to read the testimonials of what others have experienced by contacting this ministry. There is no fee, but you are able to make a donation. For those who are in the States as well as international clients, we can use voice or video chat on Skype, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, or Viber. I look forward to praying with you and all that God will do.